Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Anna Makbul, with you at PTV World. In today's show, we're going to be taking a look at two important stories. The first is going to be with reference to the current political situation of the country, where, of course, we've seen, uh, such as before as well, uh, the contrast with regards uh, to the government functioning political parties and bodies, and that, of course, the opposition parties, in particular, of course, uh, the Sunni Ta'at Council, the former PTI, um, with regards to what it means uh, to take forward uh, the democracy of the country and the role that these parties are going to be playing in. We saw that both uh, the PPP and the PMLN leaders separately have called uh, for meaningful dialogues with the PTI, reiterating the fact that this is something that they are open to and that uh, their doors are always going to be uh, welcoming uh, to the PTI or the SIC to come forward and talk about these issues and actually move towards uh, the progress of the country with regards to meaningful dialogue. But uh, whether or not, of course, that is actually going to be taken up still remains to be seen. At the same time, of course, um, the leaders have also emphasized how uh, politics of hatred or politics of agitation and of course taking the routes of the court um, the judiciary and the establishment or the government for that matter um, is something that is not going to be helpful for the country in the long run but this is something of course that the PTI has to choose for themselves and so they're going to be um, open to dialogue but at the end of the day of course the ball is in the court of the SIC or the former PTI whether or not this is something that they'll actually explore so we're going to be taking a look at this in light of the current political situation and try and understand whether or not there is going to be or can there possibly be any tangible action taken on this front. Our next segment is going to be taking a look at what is happening um, in Gaza, in particular, of course, Rafah, which unfortunately has been uh, bombed and targeted by um, the Israeli forces, um, something that, of course, unfortunately earlier was called a safe zone. And this, of course, is extremely condemnable, tragic um, and horrifying in terms of the kind of numbers uh, that we see, the kind of videos and the targets that we hear about, um, which, of course, included women and children and also a camp where displaced people uh, were, of course, there um, as it was prescribed to be a safe zone. Um, unfortunately, of course, this is something uh, that has happened even after uh, the ICJ has actually called for an immediate halt of fighting in Rafah, but, of course, um, uh, even despite that order um, and just a couple of days after that we saw that this bombing has continued which uh, reiterates the fact that unfortunately there is no safe place for the Palestinians and there needs to be a lot that the international community needs to do about it uh, especially with the way uh, that the suffering continues and the number of people that have already lost their lives and continue to do so in this genocide so we're going to be focusing on that at the end of the show today for this and more as always in the studios I've been joined by senior analyst analyst Farouk Batafi and Raja Faisal and we've also been joined online by our analyst um, Mohammed Muneeb Qadir and we will be of course shortly also joined by Dr. Zubair Khori. Thank you very much Muneeb for joining us and being a part of the discussion. I'll start with you with reference to the statements that we've heard uh, from both um, leaders of the PMLN and the PPP separately talking about meaningful dialogues um, with uh, the SIC or the uh, former PTI and I want to understand your perspective of whether there is any real change um, in this rhetoric or real substance to this rhetoric as compared to what has been said previously because uh, being open to dialogue is something that we have heard from these political parties even before perhaps the stance that they have sort of maintained but I want to know whether um, this particular um, uh, instance of this coming from these leaders um, around the same time or both parties also uh, talking about this meaningful dialogue means anything fundamentally more than what we've seen previously and could possibly point towards um, such efforts already taking place? So, uh, yesterday, uh, amidst much hype and hoopla, uh, you know, the KPCM was seated next to the Information Minister, uh, Mr. Tal Tar, and he was involved in the meeting. Uh, of course, SIFC, uh, the aim of which is to increase foreign direct investment in the country, uh, consists of the prime minister and the army, uh, you know, army chief, uh, as well as chief ministers from all the provinces. So, considering that there was extremely hostile language coming from the KPCM, uh, Mr. Gandapur, a few days back, and then he was sitting next to the, you know, uh, current government and uh, members of uh, other provincial governments yesterday. I think that shows that perhaps. PTI or Sunni Etihad Council or whichever way they identify themselves as are coming to the realization that there is only so far as they can go in their so-called fight with the you know uh, federal government and the current uh, setup. Uh, but again, 
you know, we've noticed that this is short-lived. Just a few weeks ago, like almost a month ago, the same Mr. Gandapur was also photographed with Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif, and then he went on a rant against uh, Shabazz Sharif Saab and PMLN leaders. So there is that political uncertainty which looms, and it would be really bad if that continues for very long, because, I mean, I've just been reading uh, headlines uh, suggesting that, you know, foreign direct investment has increased by around 172% in Pakistan. Mr. Masaddiq Malik has also been uh, talking about the fact that uh, you know petrol prices are going to be more aff affordable, inflation is going low. So any political uncertainty or political upheaval can spell doom for you know the already very precarious economic situation that Pakistan finds itself in. It's also not to be I mean uh, ignored the fact that you know from Mr. I mean the uh, founder of PTI his account on Twitter. Uh, is comparing himself to Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, somebody whom he used to call a traitor a couple of years ago, and now he's comparing himself to Ms., you know Sheikh Mujibur Rahman from 1971 uh, as if you know he was a victim. So this, uh, I think, incoherence in the PTI slash SIC's narrative and talk uh, is, I mean, it poses a threat to the kind of. Um, cordial relationship that we saw between uh, Chief Minister Ali Amin Gandabur from KP and the rest of the federal and provincial government representatives on the SIFC. Right, absolutely. Um, and Faisal, with regards to what we have discussed um, previously as well, particularly when we talk about the PPP, uh, this is something that you've also pointed out um, to a number of our guests on the show as well, and otherwise also of the PPP actually taking a lead in, in, in this dialogue or, or using their own networks and connections within the party as well. But I want to understand um, whether you think uh, that there is a change in the way that they're actually going to be um, approaching the situation because they've always, of course, said that they want to go ahead with talks or they encourage talks with the government and if asked will be uh, willing to play a role in mediation um, but do you think that now they're going to be more actively looking at this yes and obviously uh, i know i have been advocating in past as well and still i do that uh, and uh, today i want to every uh, you know obviously i want to uh, declare them as a buffer zone of pakistan's politics in Pakistan's uh, political spectrum, you would always see uh, People's Party playing the role of a buffer zone because they never shut the doors of, uh, uh, you know, negotiations and tables of the negotiations are always open for them. And they have the right people to do it as well. And uh, as uh, in past, I have been mentioning uh, about quite a few names. And uh, yes, there are names within the People's Party who can play a role. And uh, I think government knows about it as well. And at the same time, all of the uh, power hubs, they know that uh, People's Party ha has the uh, you know, right names that can play the role. But when it comes to, of course, uh, you know, the current uh, political rift, which is uh, uh, going on right now, uh, of course, there are certain things I would agree with uh, uh, you know, Muneeb. Uh, by the way, Muneeb has uh, uh, come to our show after uh, many days. And uh, thanks to him and uh, request to him that he should always be coming in, into our show because uh, he's uh, sort of part and parcel for us. Um, when Muneeb said about, uh, you, you know, uh, people, uh, I mean, PTI's stance, today's stance, the way they were highlighting Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and they were uh, sort of equalizing today's situation as if it was 1971, I think there are certain things which needed to be reminded to PTI that they have been doing in past and that uh, uh, whatever they have been doing in past that was true to the best of my knowledge and their knowledge as well why i say this because if we if you take the example of sheikh mujibur rahman if you uh, take the example of uh, mukti bahini uh, the members of the mukti bahinis they were uh, you know constantly in 1970s if, uh, if early uh, 1970 and then before 70s as well they have been crossing the border into india and they were getting uh, uh, trained out there and there were uh, certain uh, you know uh, of course allegations on, on them and proofs as well uh, they do exist at that time they were even uh, getting transported to russia to get trained out there at that time and of course it was all because of a plan and that plan was to of course uh, you know cut pakistan into uh, two pieces so, so that uh, the two front threat which India had at that time that can be reduced only to one front and that was to of course their 
Western Front and that is what we had to see in coming future. And it couldn't have been possible, of course, with the help of uh, Mujibur Rahman and Mukti Bahinis and whatever they did at that time, of course, it was, uh, you know, uh, betrayal to Pakistan and that's how it should always be remembered. And our soldiers, they fought in 1971, they fought in 1965 for the motherland and it, it, it has always been, uh, you know, uh, talked about and the way they are highlighting today that, uh, you know, Pakistan army played a negative role in that, no, not the case. I mean, I hail from a family uh, who's, I mean, there are, uh, uh, you know, people who have served uh, in 1971 war, they led their lives and there is uh, of course one immediate family member who along with his whole family, we never been able to of course, uh, you know, even receive their uh, dead bodies from, uh, uh, from Dhaka. They were stationed at that Dhaka at that time and we couldn't get even their bodies. So this was mm. the case and Mukti Bahini played the, the betrayal role to Pakistan and they betrayed Pakistan and that's how they should be remembered. This is a message for, uh, of course, PTI and everyone out there who's uh, sort of claiming that somehow he was a, a freedom hero or whatever uh, they want to label him with. Now coming to, you know, uh, PTI, the current PTI's uh, sort of political role and how KPK's uh, government is playing. I think uh, KPK's uh, chief minister, he has figured out that there is, of course, uh, uh, while he's sitting with the government people, be it central government or the other CMs from the other uh, provinces of Punjab, mm. of course, he is having a responsibility of uh, the KPK people, people of KPK. So he has to behave the way a chief minister should be behaving. But when it comes to, of course, sermons and, uh, you know, pressers and press conferences, of course, he's maintaining his rhetoric. And uh, this is what it is, political scoring, political mileage. This is very dear to him and that's what he does. So we will be seeing in coming days as well that whenever he's, uh, you know, uh, on a sort of non-official podium, he would always be utilizing all of these slogans. And uh, of course, he would be speaking against the government, be it uh, Punjab government or be it the central federal government. He will be speaking against them because he knows that that is what his uh, uh, political mileage is and that's how he can increase it further. Right. So, uh, but whenever we'll see him sitting in the government, uh, speaking to them for, uh, you know, matters which are, uh, uh, you know, uh, which are going to be in the favor of uh, people at large of uh, the KP. So I am expecting and that's how it should be that he would be, of course, uh, you know, taking it seriously and uh, with, a, with a saner stance. And I think uh, that's what we are going to see in future. All right. Uh, let me also welcome in the debate Dr. Zubair Ghari, who's uh, joined us online. Uh, Dr. Zubair, can you hear me? Dr. Zubair, are you with us? I can hear you. Yes, I Great. can. Great, we can hear you as well. So, Dr. Zubair, of course, we're talking about the current political scenarios, and especially in terms of the possible dialogue um, or any opportunity of reconciliation uh, between uh, PTI and the PMLN and PPP. Um, and, of course, you've heard the discussion also, but I want your take um, as well in terms of uh, whether you think that this is just political rhetoric again. Um, and, of course, as we've seen, a series of changes happening with the PTI also changing in stance and perhaps different political leaders also doing the same. Um, what exactly uh, do you foresee um, in terms of how um, the, the opposition and the government is going to move ahead um, with the possibilities? Um, do you think that this, these are just statements or uh, do you see them uh, transpiring into something more tangible um, uh, in terms of any sort of reconciliation in the parliament? Well, thank you very much for taking me on the program. The first question that you have asked there is an in, there is the chance of reconciliation. Come on, what we are talking about. They are the opposition party. It is their mandate to make fuss, to make the life of the ruling party difficult to govern the state of affairs. So if they are behaving like that, they are entitled to their position. But yes, there should be some rules of the game. There should be some behavioral tendencies towards, uh, towards some peaceful discussion. But if you are asking them to keep their mouth shut and do not say anything against 
uh, whatever the government is doing, everything is hunky-dory. Come on, give me a break. Don't do that. They have to do that because they're the opposition party and they must make hue and cry. But the point here is that both sides, the opposition party or the government parties, whatever they are doing, wherever they are doing, give the people some break. The people are suffering. The people right, are Dr. Zubair, I absolutely agree. But I want, to, I want your perspective on this because we absolutely understand, of course, that a healthy opposition is necessary to, to, to democracy and that does not mean for anyone to keep their mouths shut. In fact, the need to really open them and behave like the opposition that is needed for, for democracy to continue. But of course, the, the, the talk that we're having right now is dependent on the way that PT has behaved in the past of how these political parties have behaved previously or the kind of rhetoric or the stances or narratives that we have seen and the actions that we've seen, particularly May 9th last year, in that reference, in that context, do you see the role of a healthy opposition being played by this political party? No, I, I, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. There is no healthy or unhealthy opposition. Opposition means opposition. They will be shouting from the rooftops. They will be calling the uh, government activities against them. But yes, I agree with you here that there must be some sense that should prevail in their talk. But the point here is, uh, besides this point, whether they are uh, shouting from the rooftops or not behaving, blah, 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 this, 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 both government and opposition parties give the people of Pakistan some break. 40% of the Pakistani population is uneducated. They are out of the school. These are the uh, illiterate people. These are the unemployed people. These are the hungry people. These are the people with least opportunities in life. And what we are talking about, we are talking about somebody said this, somebody said this, somebody said that. We must talk on issues. We must talk on poverty. We must talk on food. We must talk on engagement. We must talk on building new infrastructure. We must talk about education. We talk about giving safe, clean drinking water to the people. Let them talk whatever they are doing. There is not always to talk back to the opposition parties. This is their job but to do. Show your performance that this is what we are going to do. Here we are. There's no need to go to the media every time when some opposition party uh, 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 shouts or, or badmouths something. Just they have one, uh, uh, one province in their control. The rest of the three provinces are under the ruling party. Give them some good things. There are some good things happening. The inflation is coming down. These are very good numbers. They must be talked about. There are some good things happening. Investment is coming into Pakistan. SIFC is playing a very good role. There have been some activities going about, uh, about the uh, uh, technical education that is going to be provided to the youth. Some good things are happening in the province of Punjab. Other provinces should take lead about it. Let them talk about whatever they are doing. That's their job what to do that. If they are not shouting, what else you are expecting them to do? This is also our job to actually talk about issues that <laughs> are uh, making news, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This shouldn't be the topic of discussion, by the way, today. That what Gandapur has told and what Gandapur has bad mouthed about something. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, Farooq, I want your take on that as well in terms of um, how you see the situation, particularly in light of um, uh, the, the role of the opposition that has been talked about. And add to that in terms of uh, when, when, we, uh, when we say issues, of course, I understand that, uh, of course, the essence um, in terms of what matters to the people um, are tons of things that, that you know, we have, of, of course, covered in various programs, including security, economics, and, of course, other things. But I want to understand that at the end of the day, uh, does that not also boil down to the individuals or the decision makers that are actually running the country or what they what their viewpoint is or what their perspective is and how they actually take the situation or what they're doing about those issues and so essentially what do you think really holds value here or what is more important um, in terms of how we look at the situation thank you very much Sanam I've waited uh, patiently for my turn so I hope you will also indulge me when I actually speak about Don't I various uh, <laughs> not, <laughs> not really <laughs> but uh, okay um, uh, there are many moving parts right first of all we have to actually because Faisal actually explained that so in uh, at length yeah. I wanted to actually also talk about this Bangladesh comparison mm -hmm. right uh, there's a reason why it shouldn't be done that way. Uh, and uh, the reason is, one, anybody who thinks that 
today's Pakistan faces something similar to what Pakistan faced then when Pakistan had two wings where one, one of the wings that we lost was separated uh, by a landmass of the most, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, rival country possible, right? Mm -hmm. The country with whom you had already fought a war mm -hmm. with whatever we have now is really silly. Because historically, geographically contiguous countries, a uh, country with geographical, uh, geographically contiguous elements don't lose land that, that easily, right? It is thought, uh, thought stupid to actually bring up that comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, I w also wanted to actually talk about Sheikh Mujib uh, comparison as well. If somebody actually sees themselves as Sheikh Mujib, they should know what happened to Sheikh Mujib after uh, Bangladesh became independent. Mm -hmm. Within years, he was shot down by his, his own army, mm -hmm. right? So please, uh, 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 enough of all these silly comparisons. Let us focus on what Pakistan deals at this moment. Uh, Pakistan is facing a lot of economic challenges, and we have to, uh, Dr. Saab is right, we should be talking more about economic uh, challenges rather than all this, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, fluffy things and useless things. But here's, here's the problem. I totally get it when we say that the opposition should play its role. My only problem is that when you talk about the, this particular opposition, it is uh, uh, behaving like uh, a victim of, of a concussion and uh, concussion that is self-induced. Mm -hmm. What happens with all strongmen everywhere, or populists, they have actually, one by one, uh, lost all the leverage that they had. Uh, and then what happens, right? Once you have actually uh, dug yourself into a ditch, what happens then? You start leveraging things that should not be leveraged. For example, federalism. Federalism in this country is, of course, a serious matter. And when you actually start behaving as if you are going to become the second Mujib or Rahman, then you, you should realize where you are at. You have lost so much leverage that uh, once upon a time you were in government, right? You did not have flexibility. Then you went out of power, uh, power but you also lost, lost parliament's seats. Then you had two governments in Punjab and Khyber Pakhtun, where you dissolved them oh. based on hearsay. And after that, also repeatedly kept on doing what you were told will be counterproductive to your interest, including May 9th. After that, your leader is behind bars. Whatever is happening to your own leadership is quite, uh, you know, astounding because this is mostly consequences of your actions. And now you are trying to actually leverage all that. The problem is, first rule of politics, never uh, end up in a situation where you need to be rescued. Now, every story actually comes up with what? Uh, Faisal was uh, regaling us with the uh, idea of uh, People's Party helping out PTI. Okay, but remember what uh, PTI has been repeatedly saying about People's Party? What kind of language is all always used for Asif Ali Zardari, Bilawal Bhutto Zardari and the rest? Of course, there are people who actually joined the party and came back, and there are people who were actually promoted by, uh, you know, uh, Imran Khan Saab as uh, somebody who could actually join the party. Uh. But whatever happened to your own people, this is a party where everything is actually uh, that everybody is uh, after everybody else. And that is why the chief minister in, uh, is in such a difficult position. Because the moment he was elevated to become uh, uh, the post of chief minister, five, six groups actually started immediately undermining him. And we know who they are. And after that, he has to repeatedly prove to his leader that he is loyal. And yet he has to actually prove to the, to the state of Pakistan that he is loyal to the idea of uh, federation and he is, the, uh, he is also loyal to the constitution. So these are human beings, Sana. Mm. Uh, all these human beings have their limits. Everything breaks under pressure. 
why the hell would any party put the own leaders under this kind of pressure just because their leader could not be actually open to reason when it counted the most? Right. Absolutely. Um, Muneeb, I also want to discuss the uh, defamation <coughs> bill uh, with you and, and, of course, its, its own uh, consequences with regards to uh, the current political situation. And, of course, different parties have their own stances on it. Um, but um, what do you think in terms of uh, how it will impact the political situation and whether um, in, any, in any way it, it is a welcome development? I mean, I understand the concerns uh, which surround uh, fake news, but let's not forget that people like Donald Trump also used to use this term uh, to their own advantage, that whatever news that was uncomfortable to them, they just used to label it as fake. So unfortunately, in my view at least, the defamation bill, uh, which has been introduced in the Punjab Assembly, does not give us concise or very, uh, I think, uh, how do I say, it doesn't give us a precise definition of what it means when you say fake news, what it means when you say defamation, what kind of statement is going to be considered defamatory. So the fear is that this kind of a bill is going to have a chilling effect, the kind of chilling effect that particularly Section 20 of PICA had. And I remember that PICA, although was introduced by the PMLN government, uh, was later criticized by the very same PMLN when they were in opposition. So the current Punjab government needs to be very mindful of the fact that they are not scoring an own goal uh, under under the guise of, you know, Defamation Bill 2024. Uh, because unfortunately what it does is uh, it proposes to introduce a special tribunal and these uh, special tribunals are operating outside the mainstream courts and the mainstream judiciary. Uh, I, I believe that the punishments are too severe because in the rest of the jurisdictions, if I were to consider in international jurisdictions, you know, such high amounts of damages and fines and punitive measures are actually being uh, scaled down. But in Pakistan, we've already seen PICA and more amendments are being proposed to PICA as well, over which People's Party has reservations. So in addition, we are seeing this new defamation bill, even though we have defamation offense under both, you know, the PPC, and it's also a civil wrong under the defamation ordinance. So again, my point is that there is a lot of fear, and I think that the fear is justified that this may not have effect on independent reporting, journalism, and I don't want to be sitting on your channel and self-censoring myself in an unhealthy way. So, Muni, what, what do you think is the need for this then if you think that this is something that, that, that has a pre-existing infrastructure as well and um, something that, of course, hasn't been properly defined as well and it seemed like there's a hurry to pass the bill as well. Uh, why is that? I think because, uh, I mean, I might be reading too much into it, but those in power are always going to pass laws which limit free speech. And then I, I believe that those who dissent, it's their duty to make sure that the government is fair and transparent. You support the government, where they're introducing healthy laws. And by healthy laws, I mean that, you know, what Pakistan and particularly Punjab need the most right now are laws targeting hate speech. And defamation is not our biggest problem. Hate speech, communal, sectarian divide and violence. I think that is something which poses a huge threat to not just our national security, but also to our economy. So we need to come up with bills and laws which instead define what fake news is. Because fake news, we've seen that coming from the opposition as well. We've seen that that they've tried to sabotage IMFDs, they've tried to uh, compromise our foreign relations, and we cannot afford, Pakistan cannot afford it at this time when, you know, UAE has invested uh, money with us and the Emir of Qatar has accepted uh, the Prime Minister's invitation as well as the Emir of Kuwait to visit Pakistan. So now that things are moving on to an upward trajectory uh, when it comes to uh, our economy, we need to target fake news, of course. But we need to make sure that the lines between uh, constructive criticism and fake news, they do not become blurred, so they need to be defined. Unfortunately, the defamation bill is very vague on what really is meant by defamation. So come up with a very, I think, uh, an inspiration could be taken from other jurisdictions as well, uh, a statement which is likely to expose an individual to hatred, contempt, or ridicule, or to be shunned. For example, now that would be I, 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 what I call a precise, a concise definition. Short of that, 
uh, we're inviting trouble and self-censorship over us all over again. And we cannot afford that either. Even that actually uh, has has a lot uh, that is open to interpretation, but yes, best. Yeah, Muneev, a quick question. Right. Of course, uh, you might have uh, obviously seen, uh, uh, you know, whatever is coming in this context uh, related to the defamation bill. Uh, we know that uh, satire in the news world, of course, you know, it uh, it has a space and it is part and parcel, and of course, it is considered a sort of uh, journalism as well. Uh, now, when we are on the social media, of course, of course, there are uh, many accounts that are, of course, uh, you know, sharing the satire side of uh, the news as well. Would it be considered as the fake news, and ca can it be taken to the courts under these, uh, you know, defamation laws, the new ones? Uh, Munib, I'd, I'd request you to hold your th thoughts on this question because uh, Dr. Zubair has been waiting for a while, so I'll just uh, give him a chance also to uh, comment on this issue, especially in terms of um, the issues that you've already raised. So, Dr. Zubair, I want to understand your take on when we talk about, of course, uh, um, the journalist community, of course, or even politicians and leaders um, and their right to talk uh, or their right to criticize um, and uh, be open in expressing their thoughts. And then, of course, with the way that this uh, defamation bill um, can be abused in this regard, um, how do you propose uh, the situation should really be looked at and the nuances that are involved? Um, because at the same time, defamation or fake news is an issue, uh, but it is one that is sensitive. So how do we deal with it? Dr. Zubair, can you hear me? I think he's left. Yeah. Dr. Zubair, are you with us? I believe he's not. Mm -hmm. So, Maneeb, um, you have a chance to take that up and Faisal's <laughs> question. Lucky day. It's very healthy in public discourse. Extremely healthy if done right. Now, you see, the new defamation bill uses words like purposeful misinformation fake news and purposeful misinformation does it and now that's the question which should interest us more does it really lay down a precise condition for the mens rea elements that need to be proven and for those who are not acquainted with legal terminology mens rea means the level of intent or you know the mental state the state of mind behind a particular statement or a publication or a, a, an action uh, purposeful is the you know, uh, keyword here. The, if you're spreading purposeful information, it should mean that you're doing it with malice, without belief in the truth of what you're saying, or without honesty. And then the standards of honesty, are they to be defined subjectively or objectively? Once they are laid down in the law, I have no objections. I don't think it will have any chilling effect. I don't think that, you know, uh, satire, which is a part and parcel of political discourse is going to be targeted necessarily. So I'm not against the idea of defamation, but I'm saying that, you know, in, instead of defamation, because we have plethora of defamation laws already, how much, how many more do we need? What we need are fake news laws, but fake news should never mean that uh, information which those in power don't like, because that would always be uh, undemocratic. Or, and on the other hand, we need anti-hate speech laws because Pakistan desperately needs it. I think every country has its own challenges, but Pakistan within its own culture and local context has been, as I've said previously, marred by this menace of hate speech. And uh, for example, I'm very glad that the way that this program has conducted the debate on PTU World, I've never heard hate speech here. But unfortunately, on a lot of, you know, private media channels, I think that people, panelists, and even TV anchors, they speak very irresponsibly. And hate speech is where you endanger a particular individual or community's right to life or their right to exist. That kind of uh, speech needs to be targeted, that kind of legislation is needed with exactly that kind of definition which I've just mentioned right now. All right. Thank you very much, Muni, for joining Mani. us and being a part of the discussion and sharing your thoughts. But if you wanted to add something on this issue. All right. Uh, Sana, I just wanted to actually bring out uh, two or three nuances which are very important. First mm -hmm. of all, uh, uh, what has been uh, our biggest complaint in the past 15, 20 years? Uh, repeatedly, as a journalist, I've been focusing on one thing, that is libel laws are very weak in this country. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, Pakistan's uh, defamation laws are non-existent. Uh, you can uh, send somebody a show cause notice, but there is no way 
any case actually comes to a closure. So that is a very legitimate demand because in the absence of defamation law, which is strong, like in UK and in the US, elsewhere as well, in the absence of those laws, what happens? In the uh, absence of that, because Pakistan does not have the kind of institutional strength or uh, institution support for free media, mm. usually governments actually start behaving like dictators, right? It has been happening throughout the uh, country's history and it will continue to happen till the time we fix that problem. Having said that, now I have to understand and I have to appreciate as a student of history where uh, things actually usually go. It, I'm uh, <coughs> not kidding when I say every time uh, PMLN actually comes up with any law that is complicated and which is controversial because it, uh, it doesn't have uh, the kind of uh, debate that was needed. May it be accountability bureau that later on became National Accountability Bureau, who was facing the music in those NAV laws? It was P PMLN. Um, uh, account uh, anti-terrorism court, special courts were created under law uh, by Mia Nawaz Sharif and his party. And who was uh, in 99 facing, the, uh, you know, presenting himself in those uh, court, court cases? Mia Nawaz Sharif. Mm -hmm. Then PECA, uh, uh, PECA laws, right? Mm. Uh, there too, a lot of people in the uh, PTI has four years who face the music. Who were they? They were from PMLN or their supporters. And now here, here comes another thing. Now the biggest problem is any system that reinvents the system or creates a parallel process, that, that is troublesome for me, right? If you actually create uh, change laws at the center, and you create such uh, legal provisions that normal courts can automatically take care of the matter, yeah. then what else is needed? But the problem is that we perhaps don't have that kind of uh, level of input that was needed. So I think that it is going to uh, become more controversial. Right, yeah. and, and that's unfortunate, but of course um, we have the hope that things go better um, and we move in a positive direction. We're also going uh, to look at in, uh, in the show the, at the end uh, at what is going on in Gaza, <coughs> in Sorry. Rafa, and of course the series of attacks that we've seen uh, by Israel um, last night um, are something of course that have left, uh, left everyone devastated and of course um, has really added to the miseries um, and the number of horrifying events and images that we've seen coming out um, of Palestine. And so Faisal, I want your take on this in particular in terms of how we've just talked about the ICJ ruling. We've talked about how it's binding. We've also talked about how it's not going to be enforced or it doesn't have a mechanism to be enforced and that Israel can get away with it. And it seems that it has once again because um, a number of days after that we've seen this, this attack. Um, and of course what Israel's own narrative is uh, uh, is different in terms of um, how this is in response to Hamas attack or that they were targeting, of course, um, Hamas uh, militant groups. Uh, but at the same time, we know that this was a safe zone uh, that was targeted and that we have people who were displaced in camps, women and children um, that were attacked and that um, were burnt alive. And so this is extremely important in terms of what uh, this entire issue has been since October. Um, but when we hear this news, what do we do? Well, Sana, this is, uh, you know, a situation, a very saddening situation in which, of course, uh, you know, ICJ clearly tells, uh, you know, government of Israel or the Zionist government of Israel to, of course, uh, you know, uh, pull back your forces and uh, this must end now. But it is not ending. And to some extent, I mean, I since, uh, uh, since I went through that news uh, earlier today, I have been thinking about one thing, that they keep on blaming it on Hamas. To me, it feels as if Hamas doesn't exist anymore. And they are just using Hamas as a reason to, of course, bring havoc on uh, these innocent people, innocent Gazans. And who's getting killed? I mean, women, children, elderly, uh, they, uh, the ones who are very poorly. And they are, of course, trying to hide there, trying to save themselves. And what is being dropped on them? Weapons of mass destruction, I must say. And we know that WMD was a sort of a term which was used by the Western countries to, of course, uh, you know, hit quite a few countries in past. But now is the time when 
them WMDs were never used or maybe if it was claimed that they were used and uh, on ground there was no evidence that they, uh, WMDs were used against the people at large. Now is the time, I mean the world is watching, everyone can see that WMDs are being used against, against the uh, you know harmless people, against people who are you know helpless and they are getting burnt alive, burnt alive by these weapons of mass destruction and mass destruction is being brought on innocent people only because of one reason that they are giving reason or oh, barrage of rockets was fired from there uh, by Hamas. To me, I don't think Hamas exists anymore and I don't think somebody is barraging all of these rockets uh, onto uh, Tel Aviv knowing that Iron Dome is there and it is going to protect, is, uh, protect it anyway and the technology at its best is being used by Israel to protect itself but then at the same time they are uh, using the same technology which is being uh, you know catered by the western countries as well and armed by the western countries as well and uh, uh, you know indiscriminate bombing is taking place especially uh, on the regions where uh, uh, people are just trying to hide trying to uh, safeguard themselves and they are uh, uh, simply you know seeking food around they are they are the ones who search for food and rather than food, one, one day they just uh, you know, get bombed by these uh, WMDs, I must say, and uh, they are no more. This is a saddening situation. Right. And I, 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 I don't know why, but uh, the saner world uh, in the West is still quiet and still sort of giving the reasons uh, to, the, to the rest of the world through their media that uh, this is why Israel is doing whatever, whatsoever the reason is. Uh, behind uh, that Israel is doing it still they are you know committing course, a crime against humanity uh, that, they, that's a given but they I've are committing a right. crime against humanity mm -hmm. and every step which is being taken by them every action which is being committed by them it is a war crime and it should be considered as a war crime and it's a it's not a war I mean it's you know, not a war crime Sana, actually Sana, it's just, genocide just one liner, let me, let me one actually liner. just yes just quickly, a one liner please. You know, in media, every time I see, it's like war, war between the, uh, uh, Palestine, oh, Gaza and Israel. It's not a war. It's not a war. In war, you have two armies that are fighting each other. It's not a war. It's a genocide. It's one, you know, uh, army which is recognized as an army throughout the world. And it's a mechanized army and it's a fully armed army. And the other side is the innocent people innocent be people being brutally murdered by this army. Right, this absolutely. is not a war, this is a genocide. Absolutely, um, but Farooq, um, I, I want to understand again that, that um, when we talk about uh, this uh, situation, um, of course, so since October or even decades before that, um, but especially since uh, we have seen uh, these bombings and attack continue, um, Rafa, of course, was that safe zone and safe place for mm -hmm. a lot of these people. Um, and um, we've been saying this previously as well, how um, if Rafa is, of course, also under attack, then, you know, this is something that, that is going to prove that there's no safe zone. It was, of course, there as well previously as well, and especially with the ICJ ruling, um, there's perhaps some hope that it is going to, it's going to help the situation, but it's very, very evident that it's not. But um, when we then look at the situation um, in, this, in this current scenario or the dynamic that we see where nothing really uh, seems to hold value, uh, what then... Uh, will be uh, that 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 factor or that push for for people around the world um, to step up or that line that will actually eventually take this to a resolution where we see the end of the suffering. Right, uh, Sana. Thank you very much for the question. I actually wanted to uh, say you, when you talk about safe zone, I mean uh, what part of it is difficult to understand. What we call uh, safe zones is actually targets for the Israeli government yeah. and yeah. their army, right? So uh, when you, they keep on attacking uh, innocent, uh, innocent civilians, uh, unarmed civilians, and then they repeatedly, their ministers keep on saying they should leave, they should go elsewhere, and all their doors are closed. So what are you actually telling us? You are telling us that they are going to be mowed down. They, they will all be, all be killed because it is the largest concentration camp in the world. Mm. 
uh, Gaza is, uh, I don't want to compare that to the Holocaust, but what exactly are you doing here? Uh, look at the, uh, the f faces of dolls who are injured. I mean, I'm a father of two girls. When I see these pictures, do you think that uh, anything remains of, uh, in me of uh, which you can call hope? Uh, regarding something that Faisal said, twice or thrice he mentioned WMDs. WMDs are thought to be chemical weapon, biological weapon, and then nukes. So uh, if something of that sort has happened, I haven't heard of it. Faisal is entitled to his views, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to put it on record that it is. it doesn't need to be that far yeah. to actually be far enough to condemn and to realize that there is uh, such a thing that is going on. Regarding ICJ, I told you what will happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly that is happening. He is a bully who is entitled, that is his right, and it can get away with whatever it wants to do. So happens. in the end, all this plays out and it usually is too late when these people are confronted, when the innocents have been killed. If you want to tell me that somehow the Second World War actually put an end to the Nazi threat, then tell me six million people were dead. What good did you do to them yeah. when they were suffering so much? So that is exactly what is happening here, right? right. So I don't think I'm, uh, you are entitled to have hope. Faisal yeah. is entitled also. I don't think all this grandstanding is solving yeah. anything. And Absolutely, Sana, uh, I just completely a correction. understand. You know, I use the word WMD just because of one reason, that the kind of situation and the kind of helplessness Gazans are f uh, obviously seeing right now, any weapon dropped on them is like a mass destruction, yeah, WMD. I, I just, wa I just wanted to uh, clarify yeah. the nuance. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you, Farouk, and thank you, Faisal, for joining us as always in the debate. That's all we have time for. We'll now see you tomorrow.